This podcast is sponsored by Lightens. Lightens, your best source for OE quality automotive and heavy duty accessory drive tensioning devices. We know tensioners because we invented them. So, John, I'm thinking as we were, you know, planning for this, I've been in the business for 33, four, five years. I think that I've probably known you, certainly of you that entire time. I knew you knew my father and you knew my sister, Becky. You've been at it a long time. You bet. And, you know, I know that that a lot of people know you and you know a lot, but I thought maybe you could just kind of walk us through how you got started. I know you were teed on teed on gaskets, right? Well, I mean, but to be fair, I, I really got started in the business probably about 1958, 1959, when in those days, obviously, Bill, before computers, uh, invoices had to be mailed out to the clients. And my father uh, owned his own warehouse distributorship in Louisville, Kentucky, and at least once a week, He'd bring home all the copies to the invoices, and mom would give me a, a Rolodex, and I had to get these in alphabetical order, all the A's together, all the B's together. So I started filing invoices to be mailed out to technicians, and to those days, a lot of independent jobbers uh, back in like 58, 59. So that's when I first started in the business. You have, as we stand here today, or sit here today, rather, You've got uh, everybody in your family sort of kind of in the business one way or the other. Aren't all your brothers in either automotive or trucking? Everybody's in the business. I mean, we're, we're all involved with it. It started really with my grandfather on my mother's side. And uh, dad got involved with the business in the 50s. There was a large heavy-duty business and a very small automotive business. And with my dad's uh, efforts, he grew both of them into substantial businesses that my brothers Doug and Dave operate those businesses now. Uh, My youngest brother Donnie has his own repair shop uh, in Lexington, Kentucky. And during the years, my sisters worked in the business either at New Global Warehouse or Alaska Truck Parts, as well as a company called Triad, which is part of Epcor now. My sister Karen was with them for a number of years. So my wife talks about the early Thanksgiving meals. When I was on the manufacturing side, one brother heavy duty, two automotive, a sister in the computer business, and quite an interesting Thanksgiving dinner conversation would be had at our house. I bet you did have interesting conversation. When, when, when you talk about how'd you get started in the business, I mean, where I'm at today, I really need to thank Wix Filters, of all people, because it was 50 years ago, they awarded me a scholarship to attend this place called Northwood Institute and take a program at those days called Automotive Replacement Parts Management. Yep. And it was it was the study bill of what we do we all know how Northwood has prospered and is a university now, uh, not an institution. Uh, when I graduated, I was released from the institution. <laughs> uh, today, they actually get diplomas and things like a real university. But uh, that's what got started me on the on the manufacturing side of the business. And you mentioned gaskets early on. That's how I got involved with McCord gaskets when that came around about 1986. So when I graduated, the uh, number one of six kids. Dad said it'd be a good idea to work outside the family business for a couple of years. We've all done that. And I was fortunate to uh, know a great man by the name of Doc Nyhart. God rest his soul. His son, Jack Nyhart, owns a company called PTC. Uh, Doc was the president of Allied Eastern Corporation, which sold AECU joints. And he hired me right out of college as a field sales representative and my first territory bill if you can believe it san antonio texas wow so after uh, six years with aecu joints i accepted a position with the dab industries which was michigan engine bearings and i became their national sales manager for their warehouse distributor division 
And so in 1986, we were purchased by a small conglomerate out of Iron River, Michigan called JP Industries. Shortly after they bought us, they bought McCord gaskets. And about 15 minutes after McCord, we bought Cleveland engine parts and then put together that big package, which became known as Cleveland engine parts. Uh, we did great. And then in 1990, JP Industries sold the entire company to a British firm called Turner & Newell, TNN, that were very large in the engine parts business globally. And we took over their responsibilities for North and South America, as well as Southeast Asia. And that's when I first got really exposed to China uh, because I had a Hong Kong distribution center that began reporting to me in 1992. So I started going that way to, to find out what was about uh, China, Southeast Asia, and how exciting that engine parts business is. So the, the Turner Newell people were a great company. In 1998, they were purchased by Federal Mogul Corporation. So we went into this uh, held separate phase. I felt like I was Moses uh, in the desert for 40 years because we wandered for eight months and then found a home with the Dana Corporation. And so AE Clevite Engine Parts uh, became part of the, the Dana Corporation along with the engine bearing manufacturing companies. And uh, I took over the Dana Engine Parts and Gasket Group. Uh, shortly thereafter, became the president of Wix Filters. Uh, shortly thereafter, uh, the president of Born Water Ignition. We decided to sell the engine management company to our good friend, uh, Larry Sills at Standard Motor Products. And we focused on, on Wix, on engine parts, and on the great company, Raybestos Brakes and Raybestos Chassis. And we launched, uh, launched Affinia uh, the end of 2004, let's say officially uh, January the 1st of 2005. And the Affinia company consisted of uh, the Wix business, yeah. Uh, and the Raybestos business, as we took the engine parts business in Clevite, and we actually left that behind with Dana, and subsequently they sold that to Molly. So Molly has the old Clevite engine parts, Michigan engine bearings. The gaskets, by the way, the McCord gaskets, after the held separate period in 1998, we had to give McCord back to Felpro Federal Mobile. Uh, I was running Victor Reince, uh with Dan at the time, and we converted a lot of those McCords uh, over to Victor Reince gaskets. But that's how you've ended up now with, you know, Victor Reince gaskets, uh, Molly gaskets, and Felpro were the three remainders in the aftermarket, substantial players. And, and come the uh, middle of 2008, uh, the board of directors at Affinia, along with me, who was on the board, uh, decided it was time for me to leave. And our, uh, let's just say our strategies weren't aligned. And because I didn't own as much of it as other guys did, <laughs> it was finally time after 33 years to come back to the family side of the business. And I was very fortunate that the good folks at the aftermarket Auto Parts Alliance uh, looked at me as a, uh, not a suitable, but as a possible replacement for a gentleman by the name of, of Dick Morgan, who was truly a, an icon in our industry. So John, just a uh, couple of kind of a fun questions. What, what was your first car? <laughs> uh, my first car was a 1962 Chevy Nova. Wow. Uh, flathead six in it. And my dad and I bought it off a chicken farmer in Frankfort, Kentucky, uh, drove it back to Louisville and it had, it had holes in the floorboard, uh, rusted out. And we drove it back to Louisville, Kentucky on the, the brand new interstate that had just opened in Kentucky, Interstate 64 between Lexington and Louisville, yep. and the car wouldn't go over 35 miles an hour. That was my first uh, car. How old were you? 16. 16, nice. 16. Then uh, Dad bought us a uh, 1967 yellow Mustang convertible. Wow. 
and now it had a uh, it had a 289 in it so it wasn't much of an engine uh but my wow. brothers doug and dave and myself the three of us so we shared that car and and it was a, a cool mustang i wish i still had it that's a pretty nice car for your dad to buy you guys to share well uh let's you know we were in the auto parts business and my dad had a really good used car lot customer so john you've traveled all over you've been to a million trade shows any memories jump out at you from Vegas or business dinners or crazy things that have happened over the many years in the business? Uh, there, there's really been so many memorable dinners. I mean, it's hard to pin down what meal was the best, what restaurant was the best. You know, I'm watching the Indianapolis 500 over the weekend. I'm thinking about San Elmo's and, right. the, and the shrimp cocktail sauce, right? Right. Yeah. I don't know if anything else is good there, but the shrimp cocktail sauce, I don't remember. <laughs> right. Uh, but if there was one thing that I ever got really caught by surprise, Vegas, AWDA, in the old days when Vegas AWDA was a standalone, and it was during the oil embargo, we had a private show, and this was still when AWDA was at Caesars. So we're going in the really way back machine. And the entertainment that night uh, for the private AWDA reception was Frank Sinatra. Wow. And, and he came and, and, and sang to the AWDA group. Uh, uh, Martin Fromm, God rest his soul, had, had, had pulled that off. And I think it was that same year that the folks at Monroe uh, at the, uh, the show in uh, San Francisco at the, at the Cow Palace uh, for their entertainment that night at the St. Francis Hotel. They had Bob Hope and and his entire band of renown. And and we went there for a reception. Uh, my dad was the WD. I was the factory guy, but dad had got me a WD badge so I could make entrance into the show. And I was glad that I'd made entrance uh, because not only was it a fantastic show, but they had way over ordered the champagne bill <laughs> and and all the champagne had to be opened. And so as you left that night, you got two bottles of Dom <laughs> that were cold and open for you to walk back to your hotel with. Lessons learned. Anything you guys are taking away from the pandemic uh, moving forward? Plus minus neutral, either personally or for your business, things you're things you may not have yeah. done, and now you're going to keep yeah. doing. Or well, Bill, I think there's a few things. You know, every time that there's a, a tragedy, right, we can learn from it. Yep. And we all learned a lot of things. So we know as business people, we all looked at places to minimize cost, because Bill, when the pandemic started, buddy, I mean, you know, was it the end of the world? I mean, we didn't know. And, and so as, as business owners, we all sort of batten down the hatches, right? Make sure people are safe and, 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 and prepared for whatever is next. So I, I was very proud of the aftermarket industry that held all the employees, all their people's health as paramount as sort of job one. And, and, and that was good. And, and I'm proud of all of our shareholders and, and their willingness to do that. I'm proud of the Auto Care Association. And I'm proud of AASA, the Automotive Aftermarket Suppliers Association, for working together to get to Washington, D.C. and make sure that the aftermarket was declared an essential business. I mean, it was important that we were allowed to remain open because we're the folks that keep America moving. I mean, that's Absolutely. all there is to it, Absolutely. is the aftermarket keeps America moving. So number two, is a repeat. Uh, I'm an old guy, as you indicated earlier. So I've been through a few things. And although they haven't been full-fledged pandemics, they've been business interruptions. Whether it be oil crisis, uh, what's going to happen with Y2K, all those type of things. And what we said to the Alliance shareholders in March of 2020, when the pandemic began, 
whatever you do, stock up. Don't destock. Get in as much inventory as you can on everything you can, because when we come out of the back side of this, there's going to be supply chain interruptions. And they'll be big and they'll be frequent. And as my daddy used to always say, you can't do business from an empty wagon. So get that wagon filled up and be ready to do business when you come back. But as you as you recall, you know, by actually late May last year, we were back in play pretty good. Big time. And June was strong. And every month since then, Bill, has been strong. The rest of this year is going to be strong. And I look for all of 2022 to be equally as strong. You know, John, that was pretty savvy counsel in March to have everybody load up on product, right? That, that was, I'm sure it felt counterintuitive at the time. It, it did. And, and uh, you know, a lot of people did not follow my advice. Uh, many did. But uh, this is one of these when you talk about where did you learn this? Yeah. Uh, I watched my dad a couple of times <clears throat> uh, and, and they weren't pandemics, but they were business interruptions of sorts uh, that were going to su cause supply chain issues. But the, the, I remember the importance of, of stocking up. And, and I would say that to everybody today. If you ever are on the cusp of another business disruption of some sort, stock up. Stock up like crazy because others won't. So, John, the yeah. shows, we got the show in 21, which I think is going to see a nice rebound. And in 22, you're going to have kind of a, a special presence and event out in Vegas, right? Yep, yep. We, we, we're, we're excited. The bill is, as you may have recalled, we had planned to do a event in Washington, D.C. Yep. In, in April of, of uh, 2021 and uh, just didn't look like that was a good idea. So we've pivoted and we're going to hold, hold that event in 2025. So more on that later. We came right back to Vegas we consulted with our vendor channel partners and said to them, where best could we bring 4,000 technicians? And they said, Apex, please bring them to Apex. And we, we canvassed our shareholders and everybody felt like by 2022, they're going to be in the start gates. Uh, let me out and let me get going. So we're going to have the third aftermarket jackpot in Vegas, this one called the High Stakes Edition. And we're looking to bring about 4,000 technicians. We're going to change our format a little bit. Rather than just Thursday, we're bringing everybody in Tuesday night. And we're going to have them on the show for all day Wednesday and all day Thursday. Why? That's what the technicians told us they wanted. They love Apex. Now, SEMA show is great. But they love Apex. They love visiting with their vendor channel partners, talking about the features and the benefits of their products. And we get so switched on with our vendors that have such great booths. They bring the right people to tell the stories. Uh, we're going to be across the uh, street at the, the Mirage. Uh, we'll do our parade across the street to the Venetian every day. And it's going to be a tremendous event. Uh, the Auto Care Association and the Automotive Aftermarket Suppliers Association, uh, they're, they're solidly behind us. They're going to work with us and look for us to do a special thing or two there, Bill, uh, that nobody else has done before. That sounds like another great event. I was lucky enough to be a little bit participate in some of your stuff last time. You guys did quite, quite the job. Really, It's really going to be a good show. We, we, we got some better ideas, but I, I think the – you know, the, the, really the saleability about this bill is the, the, the technicians say to us, we want to meet those vendors. We want to see their vendors. We want to see their booths. We want to see what they got to talk about. And, and once again, as an old factory guy here, you know, usually I'm on the show floor with Vegas for two days talking to guys like me about price, discount, payment terms, and griping. When we put these technicians on the floor, 
they really want to hear about your product yeah. and all those great niceties. And so as a factory person, there's nothing better than there's somebody that wants to talk to me about the genuine benefits of using my products. So John, you mentioned it a little bit just in chat about finding people. So when you guys are looking for people and future leaders in your organization, what, what are you looking for? Do you, do you have kind of our criteria? Well, I mean, um, you know, we're looking for all sorts of different people in the organization. Yep. And if you're looking for warehouse workers, that's one set of criteria, mid-management people, depending on what the task is. You know, if it's information technology related, we look at IT type of places. If it's operations related, operations type of places. If it's got to do with the aftermarket, we normally go to Northwood University and we start our study there. Uh, we have a number of Northwood graduates, uh, including myself, that, that work for us today. And we had one uh, new hire last year in our sales and marketing department, a young lady by the name of Kendall Schaus. And she graduated with her automotive degree as well as her master's degree from Northwood. Uh, she's a young lady from the Bay City, Michigan area. And she was delighted to relocate to San Antonio last year. And as we look for new people, uh, we'll start at Northwood. It's a good place for us to start. What's your view on the on EVs? It's, it's, it's in the press a lot. It doesn't seem to be going away. It, 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 it's here. It seems to mean, stay. I, I mean, you know, Bill, obviously the electronic vehicle, the concept of that all electric car, it's certainly fashionable right now, isn't it? It is. I mean, it's it's fashionable. It's sexy. It sounds cool. And and so when I look at the amount of ICE engines that are here today, to think all that's going to be off the road anytime soon, it it's crazy. And so I got to feel that the aftermarket as we know it has got to stay really robust next 15 years. And, and, and I think the, the demise of the ICE engine is, is, is highly overstated. Uh, I, I don't think we'll crash and burn as bad as everybody assumes. Uh, and I think if the car manufacturers had it their way, they wouldn't go as fast to electric either, but the government pressure on them is, is, is tremendous. Uh, but, but I think the aftermarket is, is we know it uh, because of the parts that we're gonna have to sell. For the next, I'm saying 15 years, it is going to stay pretty much intact. John, thank you so much for joining me today. This has really been interesting. Always great to spend time with you. And look forward to seeing you live and in person before too long. Bill, thanks very much. It was a great uh, privilege uh, for me to be on, on your show on AMN Drive Time. Thanks to you and to Babcock's Media for all you do for the great aftermarket. We both get to play in. Thanks, John. This podcast is sponsored by Lightens. Lightens, your best source for OE quality automotive and heavy duty accessory drive tensioning devices. We know tensioners because we invented them.